Bailey. I am the Director of Immigration Policy and Campaigns at the ACLU. We are here from live from our Washington, D.C. office, and I have the complete honor of also having with me today Jessica Colodal and Michael Tan, and you'll learn all about them and a little bit about their story and what they do. But I wanted to start by talking about why we've gathered today to have this Facebook Live and to engage with you. Uh, today's a really special day for a lot of us around the country. Five years ago today, um, we heard from President Obama the announcement of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. And you might have heard the word DACA get thrown around a lot, but what it is, is it's temporary protection for dreamers, young undocumented people, people who came here when they were young. Um, when I was undocumented, I came to the United States at the age of 10. Um, and even though I don't have DACA, there are many people like myself um, who came when they were young and today have this program, have this protection from deportation. They have the ability to work. They have the ability to get their cell phones, to rent their own apartments, to pursue their dreams and go on to higher education. Um, and so it's changed the lives of 800,000 people across the country and the lives of their families. Um, and so it's really an honor um, and just such a special day for us today. Um, I was thinking last night that five years ago, um, I had a call from one of my colleagues in Washington, D.C. Her name is Gabi Pacheco. And she said, you got to get yourself to D.C. Um, and the reason why I share that is because we often ask, well, how do things happen? How does DACA exist? Who made it possible? And I want to just remember today as part of the celebration for DACA to also celebrate the courage of undocumented parents, to celebrate the courage of young undocumented people, also known as dreamers, for their courage to march, for their courage to come out of the shadows and tell their stories um, and to push where we needed to push to make sure that President Obama delivered on this promise. Um, but it wouldn't have happened without years of organizing, without years of storytelling. And it's so important today, particularly under the Trump administration, where we've seen them ramp up operations, enforcement operations on the undocumented community to celebrate our victories and to commit ourselves, to make a commitment that we will protect these victories and that we're going to do everything that we can to defend and advance the rights of undocumented immigrants across the country. And so with that, um, that is why we're here today. We're eager to take questions and engage in conversation with you. But we really wanted to start by also getting to know our folks here today. Um, so Jessica, you are from Georgia, all the way from Georgia. What are you doing in DC? And tell us just a little bit about yourself. All right, well, thank you for having me. Yes, once again, my name is um, Jessica Colado. I'm a dreamer and a paralegal with Cook Immigration Partners in um, Atlanta, Georgia. And the reason I'm here in D.C. today is because I'm, um, well, I'm one of the dreamers and I'm celebrating the fifth year anniversary of DACA. So happy uh, DACA anniversary <laughs> to all my dreamers out there. <laughs> it's such an important day and, oh man, I... I Every time I remember this day when I heard the announcement of DACA from President Obama, I still get goosebumps just because um, I knew from that moment on that my life was going to change forever. And no man did it did that. It mm -hmm. sure did. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, I'm Michael Tan. Um, I'm a staff attorney with the ACLU Immigrant Rights Project. I'm part of the ACLU's legal team in New York. Um, my work is in the courts. Um, I get to go to work every day and defend the constitutional and civil rights of immigrants across this country uh, from Trump's deportation force. Um, it's a great honor to do the work and um, it's especially an honor to stand with dreamers like Jessica, like Lorella, and to defend their rights uh, and try to advance their hopes and dreams in this country. Um, I'm going to echo what others have said. Happy anniversary, half a da happy DACA anniversary <laughs> to all the dreamers out there. Um, I agree very much with what Lorella said. Um, the undocumented youth activists and their families in this country are the heroes of the immigrant rights movement. Um, I think the dream movement, the dreamer movement, is one of the most important civil rights movements today, them along with Black Lives Matter and other social justice movements. Um, they really are making history right now. And we at the ACLU are so um, lucky and so honored to be able to stand with um, you know, the dreamer community and those families um, and defend their fundamental rights and freedoms. So. Thank you, Michael. And just right before we get started, we wanted to also 
cambiar al hablar al español un poquito. Estamos acá con la Unión Americana de Libertades Civiles. Mi nombre es Lorela Praeli, soy directora de Política y Campañas de Inmigración y me encuentro el día de hoy con Michael Tan, que es un abogado uh, y hace todo lo que es el litigio, pero también me encuentro con Jessica Coloto, que es una dreamer del estado de Georgia. Y bueno, estamos acá celebrando eh, lo que es el DACA. Ya, ya van cinco años que jóvenes soñadores, jóvenes dreamers a través de los Estados Unidos tienen la oportunidad de vivir con un poco más, eh, con un poco más de paz y con la oportunidad de poder trabajar y seguir sus sueños, ir adelante. Entonces, empezamos con las primeras preguntas. Uh, we're going to start taking some questions, so go ahead and send us the questions that you have. Um, and I also, right before we do that, want to give a quick shout out Um, to United We Dream. Uh, it's a network led, it's the largest mm -hmm. immigrant youth led network led um, by young undocumented people yeah. um, uh, across the country. And they played such a critical role in making DACA possible and changing and transforming the lives of 800,000 dreamers and more. Um, so thank you for all of your courage and for all of your work. Um, so the first question we have is, how do we help protect DACA? Um, I know that we can call Congress, but is there anything else that we can do? And so, you know, I think in a lot of ways, in order to talk about how to help protect DACA, mm -hmm. it's important to tell the story of how DACA happened, right? DACA happened because people had the courage to come out of the shadows. Um, even though maybe they would have faced uh, the risk of deportation um, or they were exposing their lives uh, and making themselves vulnerable, uh, we decided to come out and tell our stories. We decided to organize, and we also, for all of the young people watching this, as young people ourselves, we decided that we had the agency and the knowledge and the ability to develop our own strategy, to use every tool at our disposal to make sure that we built our movement and that we built our own campaigns. Um, and so when I actually came to DC in 2012, uh, first in, 20, in, in 2010, Um, and all through 2011, um, there were people who were doing the work, who had laid down the foundation, but we were still sort of pushing spaces that didn't think that dreamers had the right to be there, that didn't think that young undocumented people could sit at the table and decide for themselves, this is the strategy and this is the way we're going to go forward. And so for all of you watching, wondering, what can I do besides calling Congress? Really, when it comes to DACA, Um, it is purely discretionary. And so it is a program that President Obama put in place that Donald Trump has promised he will keep in place, but we have to remain vigilant and we have to continue to organize and raise our voices. And when people are in trouble and asking for help, we have to stand with them and have a call to action to all members of Congress, to all members in your local community, so that we don't lose anyone to deportation, so that people around the country don't lose their DACA. And so what you can do is organize. Mm -hmm. Tell your stories. If you're an ally and you, this is not relevant to you directly, uh, it is very likely that there's someone in your community who is undocumented. You may not know that, but you know, making sure that you're creating welcoming spaces where people feel safe um, is really important. But I don't know, what do you think, Jessica? How, how can people help protect DACA today? And what would you like people to do? I think that's a very interesting question, and I think you did an excellent job at um, covering uh, the points that uh, that are needed um, of how to protect DACA. And I also would um, just continue urging people to share their stories. I think their stories are so powerful. Um, I remember when I was in college and I, I shared my, my story, um, some of my friends had no idea. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I honestly thought that I was going to be bullied because of it, but it was just, I was so pleasantly surprised by how receptive my, my classmates and peers were. So I think it's, it's very important to continue to, uh, to engage in this conversation because that's ultimately how we need to create a conversation for later on to make sure that DACA stays in place and to actually make something bigger out of this. Mm, right. Like DACA is not enough, right? That's yeah, what right. we need to remember. Yeah. We have such a big fight ahead. But Jessica, I think this is a good opportunity for you to tell us a little bit more about yourself um, because the community, something happened to you recently. Yes. And you, there was an outpouring amount of support from your local community, from your national community. And so I think this is a really good example and way for people to learn more about what they can do uh, to fight for DACA. 
Thank you. Um, well, once again, my name is Jessica Kowadl, and I'm a DACA recipient um, and a paralegal at uh, uh, Immigration. And that means you have a work permit. It means you have, like, what are you able to do now that you couldn't do with when you didn't have DACA? Okay. So um, I can now basically live the American dream. Um, I, I, I'm able to work um, and live without fear. Uh, it was a drastic change and basically it's a life-changing event uh, when DACA happened. I went from um, not, being a, not being able to work, not being able to drive, living in fear, not knowing what could potentially happen to me, how would my future unfold, to eventually having some sense of what I can do to help myself and how I could prepare better for the future. Um, and specifically, um, so I, once again, I, I came to the United States when I, when I was 11 years old, um, and I've been uh, in the United States and, and Georgia specifically for over 18 years. So that's that's home to me. Um, and when once again, when DACA happened, I was just so blessed and I, Every time I think about it, I still feel those goosebumps when I, when I knew that it was going to change the lives of many people like myself out there, people who, who in a way felt rejected by society. Uh, we would be, um, we were forthcoming and just happy to finally be part of a, of a bigger community as it should have been. Uh, from the beginning. Yeah, and recently the Department of Homeland Security tried to take away your protection from deportation, your DACA, right? But you stood up and you fought mm -hmm. and the ACLU um, and CUC immigration partners intervened on your behalf and they took it to court and they said something is wrong here. So, you know, we can talk a little bit more about what happened, but what I really want to know is right now you have your DACA again, yes. right? You can work again. Yes. And so there's been a lot that's happened in the last month. Um, but importantly, what what did people do? How did people, you know, I heard from your sorority sisters, mm -hmm. how did people step up in that moment? Because I think people who are watching this, who are part of the ACLU family want to know, give me something to do. Tell me, how can I help? I may not be undocumented myself, but I want to know more. I want to have all the tools and the knowledge to go out and fight for people like you, Jessica. Okay. Um, well, thanks to to the support of many people out there, starting from my sorority sisters and um, other uh, organizations, um, I think it's important for the community to organize together when we see that there is um, some type of injustice out there for us to get together, jump on board. Um, if we need to, if we need to get together to, at rallies, be um, you know, sign petitions. Just talk to the right people, um, especially the ones who are leading the cause, uh, to see what else we can do. But for right now, those are uh, some of the main things that we can do to make sure that we as a community are together and continue fighting together. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And Michael, you um, are Jessica's lawyer. Right. And so tell us about how you... Uh, the role that you've played in making sure that Jessica has her DACA. Sure, so um, as Lorella mentioned, recently uh, the Department of Homeland Security, um, after granting Jessica DACA twice, um, I think that's important for folks to know, DACA, uh, Jessica is actually a two-time DACA grantee. She got in 2013 and 2015, um, you know, in recognition of the really wonderful um, person and contributing member of, of her community that she is. Um, suddenly last month, DHS revoked her DACA status um, and her work permit um, and essentially upended Jessica's life. Suddenly she couldn't work, she was afraid of de detention and deportation, um, staying at home, not driving. Um, so completely uh, upended the life that she had built uh, through the DACA program. Um, and they didn't give her a reason. They didn't explain why. Uh, they didn't give Jessica an opportunity to Can respond they do that? to that denial. Can the government do that? Well, we, we have argued that they cannot do that. <laughs> um, and so we went to court. We filed suit challenging that what we thought was an arbitrary denial of Jessica's DACA. Um, we argued that it was unconstitutional as well because they didn't give her the basic uh, 
process, the basic due process of notice of the reasons why they took her DACA away and a chance to explain why those reasons were wrong. And recently, this Monday, we won a really important victory in the district court in Atlanta, um, ordering the government to give Jessica her DACA back and her work permit back while they take a second look at her application to renew her DACA status. So, um, you know, that, that, that's a great first win in a fight to hopefully get um, Jessica back to where uh, you belong, which is, you know, um, squarely in the DACA program with all of its protections. Now, I don't, what I don't understand, um, and I see, I saw one of these questions is Donald Trump has said he's mm -hmm. not going to deport dreamers. He's not going to end DACA. Um, Secretary Kelly, the, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, has come out publicly and reassured the community um, or tried to reassure the community. Mm -hmm. Are they lying or, you know, what is happening? Is there, yeah. a, is there a disconnect between what headquarters and what the president is saying? Mm -hmm. Or is it that his enforcement priorities are so, I mean, like he's really told his agents, go out right. and find people right. and deport them. And yeah. Donald Trump campaigned on that promise, Yeah. right? And so what is happening? How is it possible that this has happened to Jessica? Yeah. And what is the message for other DACA recipients out there because and dreamers who may not have DACA? Because right. I think um, even though there's a Trump administration, the DACA program is still in place. Right. So if you have a renewal, if you if you need to renew your work permit because they're all, you only have them for a period of two years, if you are eligible now because you've turned 15 or because you never applied before, you know, you should see a lawyer and make mm -hmm. sure that you are eligible. Mm -hmm. um, and you should be cautious, especially if you've had any contact with the criminal justice system. Yeah. Right. But uh, what else? Yeah. So I, mean, I, I agree with what you're what you're saying. I think, you know, we're getting mixed messages from the Trump administration right now about the DACA program, where on the one hand, the president and the secretary of Homeland Security have said DACA is here to stay um, and dreamers should, quote unquote, rest easy to quote the president. Um, and the agency has continued to grant new DACA applications to renew people's DACA status as it should. Um, on the other hand, we've heard about a series of cases like Jessica, where the agency has railroaded dreamers and stripped them of their DACA status or put them in detention and deportation proceedings. So I think it's hard to know what's going on. It's hard to know right now if the administration is going to live by its word and live up to its commitment to do right by dreamers. It's hard to know if they're even in control of what's going on at the agency. Um, so there is some uncertainty here. But I think the overall message is that the DACA program is still in place. Um, people who want to seek DACA or renew their DACA should, um, should look into that and to pursue that in appropriate cases. I definitely agree that you should talk to a lawyer. Um, and if you need help finding a lawyer, there are many resources out there. Informedimmigrant.com is yes. a very good hub for those resources. Um, and, you know, I think given the uncertainty, if there's sort of any, um, if you've had any contact with the criminal justice system, like Lorella said, it's really important to seek um, legal counsel and to make sure that um, you're going to be able to go forward with that application um, in safety. So. You know, and if something is completely reassuring, like dreamers say, is that we're here to stay, right? right? And people like Jessica are going to get up and they're going to fight and they're going to need you to stand with them. One of the questions that we're getting right now is, what happened to the DREAM Act? Um, <laughs> uh, and that is a very, very good question because the DREAM Act was first introduced in 2001, mm -hmm. has been introduced in almost every Congress since 2001, um, and what it would do uh, that is different from DACA is that it would create a permanent solution. It would create a pathway for young people like Jessica to be able to come forward and apply for, for um, this type of status and eventually apply to become citizens of the United States. And so um, what has happened is um, unfortunate because we could have passed the DREAM Act in 2010. We could have passed the DREAM Act as part of comprehensive immigration reform in 2012, in 2013. Um, the truth about what happened in 2013 is that Republicans controlled the House and never brought up the DREAM Act for a vote. They didn't bring up comprehensive immigration reform for a vote. Um, but, you know, DACA is not enough. Um, right. And I think a lot of people, we always get this question, which is why can't they just get in line? Why can't they get legal or do the right thing? And the answer is there, the whole point of the DREAM Act, mm -hmm. the whole point of fighting for common sense immigration reform is to create that line right. that people can, can jump on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say my mom now has a green card um, for the last few months, but if my mom in any moment was given an opportunity when she was undocumented <laughs> to get on a line and pay 
and provide the documentations to say that she's been here and come forward, she would have done it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're fighting for here at the ACLU. That's what so many of our partners have been fighting on yeah. for you know more than a decade. Um, and we are gonna need you all to continue that fight. Um, I think that we have another question specifically for Jessica. Um, and the question is, what advice, Jessica, do you have for other immigrant youth who don't have DACA, but who also have dreams of living and working here? That's an excellent question. And, um, and the only advice that I, that I have is, you know, continue, continue following your dreams. Um, if you want to pursue a higher education, go for it. Um, I know that sometimes it is extremely difficult when you're completely out of status and you don't really know what to do, but that's why um, we have uh, people fighting for, for us. And at the end of the day, we have to be our own advocates. We have to make sure that if we want to see some change mm -hmm. in this country, that we fight for it. We can't um, just um, stay still and expect others to do it for us. So we have to take the initiative and um, continue fighting or start fight fighting for something new. Well, this is actually part of your story too, right? Because you actually managed to graduate high school and college before DACA was even in place. So I feel like you're actually a great example of someone who, before the DACA program even existed and despite being undocumented at the time, fought for your future in the way you're describing. Right, so I think um, that's that's the keynote right there to just follow those dreams. I'm a big believer that everything happens <laughs> What's the quote? Reason. You have a great quote about dreams. <laughs> yes. you got to share that with everyone, in English and in Spanish. <laughs> yes. Um, um, you need to hold on to your dreams, and they will hold on to you. So at the end of the day, it's about dreams, and dreams really... Uh, make us who we are today, and es en, en, en español sería <laughs> um, uh, the um, the tien, um, en español sería agárrate fuerte de tus sueños que ellos se agarren fuerte de ti también. Muy bien, gracias. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember when I was undocumented and back in 2010 when the DREAM Act uh, was coming up for a vote here in DC I was in my last year of college mm -hmm. um, I was graduating uh, in the spring of 2011 and you know I came to DC I had I had come out of the shadows not too long not 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 I had just come out of the shadows it hadn't been that long and I remember you know being inspired by all the people around me, but I also went back to Connecticut after between the House vote and the Senate vote, and I had a breakdown. I just, I couldn't, I was so worried and stressed. I was like, I'm about to graduate, but I may not, um, I may not be able to work. So what is the point of going to college, right? What's the right. point of finishing? I sort of got in this weird state with myself, um, and, you know, I was sort of, sh I had to like shake myself and remember that you know, your knowledge is your power. Mm -hmm. um, and our stories are our power. And so to all of you young people, to all of the dreamers, to all of the undocumented people who are watching this, um, or to all of you who know someone who's in that situation, who may not have DACA, um, maybe too old, um, maybe too young, um, there is always hope, right? We have to believe that we have the power to to build and forge our own path here, our journey in the United States, and that if we call this country our home, it is on us and others and our allies to fight day in and day and night, day in and night, to make sure that we can achieve our dreams. And part of that is coming out and sharing our stories. Part of that is remembering that um, it's a piece of paper that makes a big difference in our lives, but it doesn't define us. We are more than undocumented people. Right, we have dreams, we are workers, we are in the cafeteria, and we are in the classroom teaching. Um, and so, just remember that every time that you can, and just make sure that you remind people because these are hard times. Yeah. Um, let's not kid ourselves, yeah. right? For all of for all people who either have DACA and are worried, you know, am I still gonna have it? We're gonna fight for it, we're gonna try to defend it, we're gonna do everything that we can. 
Um, but it's also really hard to be undocumented in the United States, uh, particularly when Donald Trump uh, waged a war on our community uh, from the day that he announced he was running for president. So, you know, the last set of questions that we have are, um, are current applications from DACA being approved? Um, how many people have gotten approved in 2017? And will applications be approved in 2017 and 2018? Um, so in terms of um, our current DACA, applic our applications <laughs> currently being approved, I'm giving Michael the data here. Yeah, um, thanks, they are being approved, <laughs> uh, but you know we encourage you to be careful and to make sure that you have an attorney who's, who's reviewing your applications. Um, and in terms of whether or not they will be approved in 2018 or throughout 2017, all we know is that it's being approved right now, um, and USCIS actually released new updated data from the last three months since Trump has been in office to share some numbers. Michael will do that. Uh, but we don't know if they will be approved in 2018. If they're not, we will make sure to let you know, um, as will other organizations. But for now, um, they are being approved. And Michael, what is what does it look like? Yeah, so for the first three months of 2017, um, about 17,000 initial DACA applications. So first time applicants have gotten DACA approved and there's been a lot of renewals, about 107,000 um, renewals. So right now uh, people are getting DACA granted, DACA renewed. Um, and I think if you're someone with a pretty straightforward DACA case, ha especially if you had it before, you should um, you know, very much look into renewing that DACA status when it comes up for renewal. Yeah. Great. Do we have any more questions? We're good? Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I will just close by saying, by asking you all to go to peoplepower.org um, to learn how else you can be involved with the ACLU and how you can plug into the efforts locally. There are things that are gonna be harder to do in Washington, D.C., yeah. and so much of our work here in D.C. is to defend the community and to defend some of the progress that we've had, um, but to also prevent things from getting worse for people, uh, particularly immigrants in the United States. Uh, but at the state and local level, you have an opportunity to drive change um, and to ensure that your community becomes a freedom city, uh, that your uh, city, that your state um, actually ends up welcoming immigrants um, and make sure that we are creating spaces where people feel welcomed and safe. Um, so go ahead, go out and check it out, peoplepower.org. Thank you for tuning in and until the next time. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks. you.